Someday soon, my Savior will call out my name. Hello, everyone. I'm glad you're here tonight, and I hope you're ready for a Bible class. Get your Bibles, your King James Bibles, and turn them to Romans chapter 1. Romans 1. And we'll start from there and see if we can go a little further with the First Things First series. We talked last week simply about salvation. And I want to talk to you tonight about simple salvation, but simple salvation in the sense that we're going to see it and read about it in Scripture so that we can understand what it means to us. Simple, simply salvation means that you're saved. Simple salvation means that you're able to talk about it and see it in Scripture. And the simplicity of salvation cannot be denied by Scripture. To be saved today, you don't need a church. If somebody's told you that, they told you wrong. It isn't the church that will get you saved. If you happen to be the pastor of a church, I hope you understand this. Nobody needs you to get them saved. The Lord might use you about getting them saved, and that would be with His Word. Amen? So therefore, if you happen to be a pastor watching this program, and I doubt if there's a great big flock of pastors watching this program, but if you are, Rest assured, the Lord will use you, but your attitude is to be that He doesn't need me. The person in front of me doesn't need me. Neither the Lord nor them need me. But I am willing to be used by the Word of God to show this individual the power of God unto salvation. Look, if you will, in Romans chapter 1, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew, for everyone that believeth. To the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now if you will look over in Romans chapter 3, and we read this last week, but we're going to pick up right where we left off last week. It says in verse 20, of Romans chapter 3, it says, Therefore by the deeds of the law, that is the keeping of the good stuff, the law, eschewing the evil stuff that the law points out, therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. Why, you say? Because there are so many points of the law, and in a day's time we probably couldn't count on all of our digits the number of times we get crossways of that law. So we don't keep the law perfectly. If you think you do, can I ride with you the next time you're in traffic jams? I'm, I'm just kidding. I don't, I don't want to ride with you in a traffic jam, I promise. Now look, if you will, b verse 21. But now, the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, e being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood, to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say at this time, His righteousness. The Apostle Paul, writing in Romans, says at this time, to declare God's righteousness at this time, verse 26, to declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness, that he, God, might be just, and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Oh. The belief of verse 22 is to believe in the one who had that faith in verse 22. The righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ. Believe in that one. Believe in Jesus. Now look at verse 28. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. You know the verse in Ephesians chapter 2. It says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. What a great message. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. Your salvation is not of you. You didn't save yourself. Salvation's of the Lord. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. 
Romans chapter 6, at the end of the chapter, a great chapter, says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, we talked about that last week, so tonight we're going to talk about all that salvation is. Notice in Romans chapter uh, 5, we spent, we were close there in chapter 5. We talked about the sin portion of Romans chapter 5 last week. Tonight I want to talk about what God has done for us in Romans chapter 5. Verse 1 says, Therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now if you've trusted Christ as your Savior, and I certainly hope that you have, but if it happens to be that someone's listening that has never trusted Christ as your Savior, believe that He died for your sins. Believe that God raised Him from the dead. And if God raised Him from the dead, God must not be counting your sins against you anymore. How else could He raise His Son from the dead? The Bible says God laid upon Him and made Him to be sin. Laid upon Him all iniquity. Made Him to be sin for us. The Bible says that being, having la all those sins laid upon Him and being made sin, that He went to hell. He went to hell. But God raised him from the dead. Why? Well, the reality of God's Word says that death couldn't hold him. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. So Christ didn't sin when his soul was in that human body he was in. Christ didn't sin. But he died for sins. God laid the sins upon him. And when he laid the sins upon him, it killed him and cast him into hell. And God turned his back on his son so that would occur. But then God raised him from the dead, proving three or four things. One is that Jesus Christ indeed was perfectly righteous and had not sinned in that soul. Two is that God is merciful to everyone who ever lived on the basis of that righteousness which appeared in His Son. Look here in Romans chapter 5, look at verse 6. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Now look again at verse 8. But God commendeth His love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by His blood, that's the shed blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. I thank God that I'm saved from wrath. I know what I deserve, and I know the wrath that's coming because I've, after, I've read the story. And I see it unfolding when I get over to the book of Revelation. So he says, I'm saved from this wrath through Jesus Christ. Verse 10, For if when we were enemies... We were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. Well, obviously, that's not His 33-year life on the earth. That would be His risen life. Our Savior is alive. He is risen, as He said. Our Savior is alive. We have a chance to have life in Christ Jesus. How do we do that? We believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. We trust in what He did for us. So now we're going to talk about this. We've got this hope. How did that help, having a hope? We found out about the Lord Jesus Christ. Somebody told us. I personally heard it all the time growing up. I never ever believed there was another Savior. Didn't understand hardly anything about it. But I never ever believed there was another Savior besides Jesus Christ. Really? Well, that didn't make me saved. It didn't make me a believer but not a saved person, because the night that I got saved, I was so low that I would have had to put a, I, I could have put a top hat on and crawled under a snake, and I was so full of myself and filled up, I mean, with the, with the putridness of myself, I didn't want to continue as I was, and I had no idea what to do about it. And I gave up and trusted the Lord. I said the words, I'm a mess, please save me. 
I don't think I had to say those words, so don't go away and say I got saved by my words. I got saved because there was a generous Savior right there. And the Bible said, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, I didn't have to say the words out loud, but I did have to believe on Him. And belief is not a work. It's a mental assent to the fact that Christ died for my sins. Now look what it got me, though I didn't deserve it. Look at verse 11. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. The atonement means the sin has been put away. No more sin debt. The atonement means that sin has been put away and that God has received the sacrifice for those sins. Wow. And Jesus Christ did this for me and for you when we were sinners and ungodly and enemies of Almighty God. Yet Christ died for us. The day you found out that Christ died for you, Think about what you were in your flesh. Think about what you know you were in your flesh. Christ died for you anyway. And He's given you the atonement. And when the atonement is put to your account, you're saved, secure, never to be lost. You know why? Look in Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Romans 8, verse 1. First things first, salvation. Next thing after salvation, know about it. My father used to call it a no-so salvation. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Please notice it does not say, if you walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. It says that the people who are in Christ Jesus do walk after the Spirit and not after the flesh. Read it again. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Description of them which are in Christ Jesus. Who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. How do I know that's the way that's supposed to read? Oh, well partly because it's perfect grammar. Secondly, it shows up later in the chapter and proves it to me. Notice, if you will, verse 8. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Verse 9. But you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwelleth, dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. In other words, if you haven't got the Spirit of God in you, the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of God, interchangeable, the whole Godhead is right there in that verse of Scripture, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit is right there in that verse, same verse of Scripture. And if God is, is, has put His Spirit in you, you're His. If you don't have the Spirit of God in you, you're not His. But if you are the, uh, uh, His and you have the Spirit of God in you, then verse 1 applies to you, applies to your life. There's therefore now no condemnation. Say, well, what's, what's that mean, no condemnation? It means there's no condemnation. Not too long after I began to study the Bible, I was confronted by a Baptist friend of mine about why I should no longer be a Baptist and why did I think like that. So I asked him, I said, um, I know that you believe in eternal security, right? He said, yeah. In other words, once you're saved, you're always saved, right? He says, yeah, of course. And I said, okay. You mean to tell me that if I pulled a gun out right now and shot you dead, you'd go to heaven? He says, I sure would. And I said, well, what if you took the gun out and you shot you? Would you go to heaven? He says, well, I'm not sure of that. I said, why not? Well, you're taking your own life. Yeah. Well, to, uh, and you know what he didn't want to say? He didn't want to say, how are you going to get forgiveness of that? You know why he didn't want to say it? Because he was confused by the Baptist doctrine. The Baptist doctrine, and I, if I'm picking on Baptist, jump in. It's all right with me. 
The Baptist doctrine says that you should take 1 John 1, 9 at heart. And it says if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. I don't know how many Baptist preachers in my lifetime that I heard say that. I was born and raised a Baptist, and then after age 22, and when I got saved at age 22, and for the next nine years I was in a Baptist church. Two or three different ones. Now, I like the Baptist church, but the doctrine's wrong. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Does that sound like totally justified already? Does that sound like there is therefore now no condemnation? It don't say the same. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Well, what if we don't? So I asked a couple of people in the, that particular mode. I said, so what you're saying to me is that every time you commit a sin, you confess it. Well, um, um, yeah, I, I, I think you got to. I said, yeah, but do you? Well, I think you ought to. I said, well, yeah, but do you? And he said, well, I'm supposed to. Ah! If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and we don't do it. If he's faithful and just, and that's his rule, what about those sins we didn't confess? Well, by that standard, they're still there. They're still in the way. And yet Paul says here in Romans chapter 8 very clearly, there is therefore now no condemnation. Here's why. You and I are living in the dispensation of grace and the scripture that Paul wrote is written directly to us and we'll get back to that next week. Continuing with first things first. But look, salvation is secure. You know why? Mainly because the Lord knew us real well and He knew he'd have, we'd have an awful hard time living up to this righteousness thing in our flesh. So the only way He could buy us and keep us, we've been bought with a price. The only way He could buy us and keep us is to forgive all of our sins. Wow! Hold on to Romans chapter 8 and look over in Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians 1. In Ephesians 1, the description of you and I are, is found here in all these verses. And we're not going to read all of them because all of a sudden we would chase another rabbit and we'd be on a different trail and we'd come back next week and say, what did we do last week? So look at this. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. He's obviously talking to saved people. By the way, Paul only wrote to saved people. Verse 4, According as He, God, hath chosen us in Him, that's Christ, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will. To be God's good pleasure. He brought children to Himself using Jesus Christ. Keep reading. To the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved. And then the Beloved is Jesus Christ. Look at the very next verse. The Beloved in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. We have the forgiveness of sins. We have the forgiveness of sins. That isn't all. Look over in Colossians chapter 1. In Colossians 1, notice God's activity in all of this. The night or day or morning or this moment when you trust Christ as your Savior, this is what happens. Start reading with me in verse 12. Paul says, giving thanks unto the Father. So now think about the Father's activity here. Which hath made us meet, which means worthy or apt. Which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Who, God the Father, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness. And hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Watch this. In whom we have redemption through his blood. Even the forgiveness of sins. That's two. Two places where absolute and utter forgiveness of sins is noted. 
Again, this is God the Father speaking about what He did when Christ became our sacrifice. God delivered us from the power of Satan, made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance with the saints in light, and hath delivered us from the power of darkness, translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son, and by His Son given us the forgiveness of sins. And so people say, well, I just don't think, you, you can't just keep on sinning. I mean, after all, I mean, uh, how do you know all sins are paid for? Oh, I thought you'd never get around to asking. Look in the next chapter, Colossians chapter 2. Look in Colossians 2. Long explanation about the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ and what its worth is. Look at verse 13. And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he, that's God, quickened together with him, that's Christ, having forgiven you, all trespasses. Trespasses are sins. If you sin against the law of God, you've trespassed the law. How many trespasses are forgiven? Um, all. A-L-L. -L. You know, the book of Colossians uses the word all so wondrously. You should look them up. Verse 13 again. You being dead in your sins. <clears throat> That's the condition we are. <clears throat> we have this condition. It's called a sin nature. The Bible says in Ephesians 2 verse 2 that we are by nature children of wrath. We're not by nature the children of God. Carnality brought us into this world to be carnality that we live in and carnality will cause us to die while in this world. Paul said of his own body after preaching for some 25, 28, 29 years, something like that, Paul wrote the words, In my flesh dwelleth no good thing. Hmm. Well then, here in Colossians chapter 2, there is something so complete here that Paul winds up calling it complete. Look, that, look back, if you will, in verse 9. The reference to him here is the word Christ in the previous verse. Christ, verse 9, For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him. Well, if Paul wrote this, he didn't even know you. He didn't know how old you were going to be when you got saved. He didn't know what you were going to do after you got saved. He didn't know if he was going to be a good person or a bad person after you got saved. Paul didn't even know for sure you were going to get saved, but he only wrote this to save people, so here you are reading it. So again, I ask you the question, are you saved? you got to know, somehow or another. But now you can know, by these verses we've read, the complete and utter Forgiveness of all sins. God Almighty made you complete in Christ without you ever doing a thing. Now if that evokes in you or invokes in you a reason to serve your Savior, we'll get to that. That's not first things. First things is being saved. Second first thing is let's understand this. Now go back to Romans chapter 8. I think I told you to hold on to that, but I didn't myself, so I may not have. We're going to look at the end of Romans chapter 8. As we wind up this Bible class here tonight, we're going to look at the end of Romans chapter 8. In verse 31, can't start reading there. Look at verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called, according to His purpose. Now please don't ever misquote that verse. And don't ever lop off a part of it. You'll be doing yourself a disservice. And the Lord means the verse the way He wrote it. We, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. So getting good to come out of something is not an accident. Getting good to come out of something is not a cliché. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. 
There's three very distinct things there that you should know. If you belong to the Lord, you're in the chapter all about belonging to the Lord. So in belonging to the Lord, if you're saved, you know this passage works for you if and when you are the called according to His purpose. Not because you've got some thing you want to have happen and you're praying that the Lord gives it to you. If the Lord didn't give it to you, would, be, would you be mad at Him? You see, it's got to be according to His purpose, not yours. I don't want to bust any bubbles, but you see, understand what I mean? I mean, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. His purpose is to bring forth righteousness. Look, if you will, in verse 29. For whom He, God, did foreknow, He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son. Now, if you heard that word predestinate a while ago when I was reading in Ephesians chapter 1, and it threw up some sort of a flag in your mind, you just got the answer. <clears throat> predestination on the part of God Almighty is based upon His foreknowledge. And it is not to give you a place in heaven. By His foreknowledge, He knows the people who have trusted Christ as their Savior or who will trust Christ as their Savior. Therefore, by His foreknowledge, He predestinates us, now watch the rest of the verse, to be conformed to the image of His Son. What was the image of His Son? In righteousness and true holiness, it's glory. They re he re the clouds received Him up into glory. Paul says, when Christ who is our life shall appear, we're going to appear with Him in glory. Well, He can't do that if He doesn't make us to conform to the image of His Son. Notice now verse 31. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Wow, I like that. If God can be for us, who can be against us? Amen? That's a good thing. Well, let's make sure that we're on God's side if we want God to be on our side. Okay? That's the spiritual side of life, not the fleshly side of life. Verse, uh, middle of verse 31. Uh, I'm sorry, verse 32. He that spared not his own son, that would be God who spared not his own son, but gave, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him, Christ Jesus, also freely give us all things? What is it we would be missing? Nothing. What would we be missing? Another hour of Oprah? What would we, we be missing? The next football game? How shall God not with Christ freely give us all things? Verse 33. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. Do you understand that, that that usurper, that accuser of the brethren, has nothing to say about you? When you trusted Christ as your Savior, the devil's mouth went shut where you were concerned. Now he's got these little minions running around the world and they will run into you big time as though they could do you harm. They can't do you any harm, by the way. But nevertheless, He that spared not His own Son, but delivered Him up for us all, how shall He not with Him also freely give, all, give us all things in order to get through? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Verse 34. Who is He that condemneth? Well, if I look back at Romans chapter 8, verse 1, there isn't any condemnation. Amen? Who is He that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. God, that puts Jesus Christ in our lives. Notice now verse 37, or 38 rather. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life. That's amazing. We'll shut that thing off one way or the other. Verse 38. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's a pretty good second first things first. First comes salvation, 
Second comes, what you got when you got salvation? I hope you've enjoyed the Bible study. Let me know if I can help you with anything. Give me a call, write to me, whatever. I'd be glad to hear from you. Good night, everybody. Someday soon I'll be in heaven. Someday soon.